Well, it is a delight to have you here today and for uh, me to welcome our speaker today, John Isham. Uh, I have had the pleasure of uh, getting to spend the day with him and just, just completely make him answer all of my burning questions about the world. So he's been very gracious to me. I met John a couple years ago at the Breadloaf Conference Center in the Green Mountains outside of Middlebury, Vermont. Uh, for the June Forum on Social Entrepreneurship. And I was just delighted the first time I met him by his deep sense of interdisciplinarity and how welcomed I felt to a group of complete strangers. Um, and it really was what gave me the impetus um, to come back to Westmont and say, hey, I've just been around some really cool people who can shed some really neat light on maybe what we could do in Westmont downtown. So I credit much of that with John's inspiration. Let me give you a little background about him. He has been involved in issues related to economic development and sustainability for his entire academic and professional career. He was a social anthropology major at Harvard College. And after graduating, he served in the US Peace Corps in Benin in the mid 80s, helping to lead a program to promote fuel efficient cook stoves and helping to build a primary school. I love saying that because it's so tangible. He did something that was really tangible with social anthropology, just remember that. Upon returning to the US, he worked with the East Bay Conservation Corps in Oakland, California received a master's in international studies from Johns Hopkins University. And then for the next three years, he consulted at the World Bank, where he was a researcher for the World Development Report and an assistant task manager for education and health projects in Mali and in Chad. After earning his PhD at the University of Maryland in economics, he joined the faculty at Middlebury College in the Department of Econ and the Program in Environmental Studies. From 2006 to 2009, he served as the Luce Professor of International Environmental Economics. And in 2011, he was appointed the Director of Environmental Studies and then became the Faculty Director of the Middlebury Center for Social Entrepreneurship. I had the great fortune to hear this part of this talk, a version of this talk on Saturday, and I have been chewing over some of the things that John has said since then. So I know the delight that is in store for all of us right now. So please join with me in welcoming John Isham. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel and, and, and Chris and Aaron and Sherry and Kristen, everybody who's welcomed me here over these last few days. It's been a blast and uh, really just nice to be here. It's pretty beautiful. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm really appreciative. It's, it's, been a, it's been a time for me to slow down, which is, is what I want to talk about. Um, I'm going to start this conversation with you all um, with the way I met Chris and which was at a conference in 2011, summer, at a place called Transylvania University, known colloquially as Transy, in Lexington, Kentucky. And Chris and I were both <coughs> attracted to this uh, conference, which was run by a wonderful political science professor, Jeff Fryman. And the conference is entitled, The Liberal Arts, A Contested Concept. And what Jeff realized teaching the liberal arts his entire career was that a lot of us around the country teaching the liberal arts frankly didn't know a thing about it. We knew what we were supposed to be doing uh, within a beautiful campus like this or Middlebury or, or any, any number of others, but we didn't know much about the history. Uh, we didn't know about the contestation behind the term. And so about 12 years ago now, Jeff began this, this summer session and, and Chris and I were lucky enough to be there in 2011. So we learned a lot. There's a reader that came out of it. Chris, I'm sure yours is pretty prominently displayed in, in, in your office, if, if you're like me. And just a reader that t takes us back to the history of the ancient Greeks and through the medieval period and through the 1800s into the 1900s and, and, and even up to now as to what the liberal arts is. And that the contestation, which is relevant to, to what I want to talk about today, is a tension that all of you will, will really understand and recognize right away. And it's captured by two leaders in the 1930s, President Robert Maynard, uh, Maynard Hutchins from University of Chicago, and then John Dewey, the, the great American philosopher. So for, for Maynard Hutchins, learning was about the great books. And so get the great books in front of students, have them learn, life of the mind. For John Dewey, learning was, felicitously, about doing, right? And so, Dewey saw education as the engine for social change. 
and he saw, he's very difficult to read, his stuff is very opaque, but he has something called My Pedagogic Creed, which I think was somebody who said to him, Dewey, you're brilliant, but we can't understand a word you're saying. <laughs> so he, he went, forced himself to write something that's understandable. So in My Pedagogic Creed, he talks about the fact that education is not preparing students for life, it is life. So it is life, and it's doing things now, again, an engine of social change. So that tension was, was in the forefront in the 1930s. These two duped it out very publicly for a long time. And I know when Chris and I went back to our respective campuses, Middlebury and Westmont respectively, we both were lit on fire a bit about this idea and, and probably were dissatisfied with the looking at these as two poles. And, and trying to, in, in, in a certain Hegelian way, that Dewey would have loved bring them together. So as, as, as we saw in, in the conference that ended on Saturday, bringing inquiry into action, from inquiry to action, to quote the, the, the subtitle of the conference, uh, from Hutchins' perspective, inquiry to action, Dewey, and, and how do those come together? How do we honor those? How do we find the commonalities? How do we, how do we uh, connect them? So it's been a great journey for me since then, as it has, I know, for you, Chris. And I want to start a little bit with where that journey has taken me in terms of what we've been up to at Middlebury since then. And then I'm going to introduce this idea of slow learning, which you can see comes from a big problem we've identified in this area of social entrepreneurship. I want to talk to you about what slow learning might be, how we might think about it. And this is only the second time I've given a talk about it. The first time was Saturday. So, uh, so I, I really look forward to critiques and, 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 and all of that as we finish. And, um, and then what I want to do today that I didn't get a chance to do on Saturday is to talk about how slow learning might manifest itself in, in the Christian context, as we have here at Westmont, and in the secular context that we have at Middlebury. And I, I really look forward to that part of the conversation. So as mentioned, in, in 2011, when I came back to my campus, I had become to be taken by this concept of social entrepreneurship. Uh, for a, for a, it's a contested concept too, by the way, which is, is neat. But uh, I was a, a scholar who had studied social capital. As, as Rachel mentioned, I, I was a social anthropology major. So I was somebody, and I'm an economist, so that term, social entrepreneurship, which is really about using an innovative ways, some of them grounded in business to affect social change. That was, I was a good candidate to sort of take that idea and run with it. Uh, I was aware at the time that places like Oxford, Harvard, Stanford had embraced the term that or its, its sort of uh, kissing cousin social, uh, social innovation. Uh, there was a scholar at, at Duke named Greg Dees who was trying to put it in the business context that this was an alternative way to do business. And the work of Bill Drayton, who founded Ashoka, uh, and who has put empathy, the idea of, of empathy, that beautiful human characteristic, at the center of his model of social change. So I was aware of all that, and, and a student and my wife, in fact, had begun to help me think about how social entrepreneurship could play a role at Middlebury. So it proved to be a good fit with our culture, our, our liberal arts culture. And there were three reasons for that that I want to share with you. The first is that, like many liberal arts schools, we have disciplines that help students to think about social change. So socianthro, history, the list goes on, various studies. Uh, we have uh, um, interdisciplinary studies, environmental studies being one of them. So learning of the work of Paulo Freire, the great Brazilian educator, the legacy of Ella Baker and the civil rights movement, studying social change makes one perhaps inspired to try to affect it on one's own. And, and like many a liberal arts college, we, we're, we had that going on and that was exciting. Secondly, unlike many liberal arts colleges, we're in Vermont, and uh, it's very cold in Vermont, if you have never been there, though we're having a mild winter now. It's only 20 degrees or something, but, uh, and it's also very rugged, right? Until the highways came up there in the 1950s, it was very hard to get to Vermont, and sort of a, that hard scrabble yeoman farmer you think about. So in other words, it's a very hands-on place. You have to know how to do stuff with your hands, and so, these hands-on pedagogical approaches that, again, I know many of you are familiar with, service learning, community-based learning, sort of allow students to, to test m what I might call micro-models of social change. That, too, was a good match for us. 
and social entrepreneurship in some ways is just an extension of those, right? And so I'll come back to that. So we were ripe for this idea because of that. And then the third and final reason, quickly, is we had something called the Project on Creativity and Innovation. And this was started by our, our former president, Ron Leibowitz, at the beginning of his presidency, 2005. Um, and he did something which is actually a little more familiar um, now than it was back then, which is just to create space for students to make things. You heard now about these maker spaces. So he, he founded something that we call the Old Stone Mill, which is actually, believe it or not, an old stone mill. And uh, it's just rooms where students can try stuff. They can try to start a business. They can try to write a symphony. And that was, that was sort of bubbling along and, and was starting to show traction. Students liked that idea. So for, th for those three reasons, social entrepreneurship looked like it might have a place in our liberal arts setting. A, a donor came along and, and said, do you want to help, do you want to start a center? And we said, okay, we'll talk about it. And, and that's what we ended up doing. But um, we had to do something that I recognized right away was very important. And this will take us to the problem that I identified, I, I mentioned a moment ago. The term social entrepreneurship is not a great term for a lot of people, particularly great academics. So that they don't like entrepreneurship as a term, particularly at a place like Middlebury. We don't have a business program. Um, and, and a lot of them are life of the mind people. And so the idea that students would be not just doing service learning, but now starting social enterprises was, I, I knew would be very um, offensive, <laughs> is one way to put it, to a lot of my colleagues. Turn it, to put it another way, I knew we had to make a case that these two contested concepts, the liberal arts and social entrepreneurship, were complements. So if you think of a, of a Venn diagram, if you will, that if you put those circles together, that there really was an overlap. To be frank, that was a bit of a tactical thing, right? So I, I was thinking of some jujitsu that I would need, you know, when people began to say, why the hell would we have a center for social entrepreneurship? But, <laughs> but it turns out that there really is a big overlap. And somebody asked me the other day on a radio show, what are you most proud of in terms of this? And, and, and what I'm describing to you now is actually what I am most proud of in terms of what we've done at the center. We've been able to make the case that these two things really complement each other. Or more directly, that social entrepreneurship is one way, turns out a pretty good way, to bring out the best of the liberal arts. Not the only way, by any means, but pretty good way. The sort of keystone for me on that which I want to share with you now, was um, a beautiful paper that I was aware of. And one morning, in, in, as this was all getting going, if you're like me, fellow faculty members, you're somebody who wakes up early to prepare for your class. So there I was trying to remember what you know, I was doing on a particular morning. It was a class on social entrepreneurship and the liberal arts. And I had this fleeting memory of a piece written by the great environmental historian Bill Cronin. And it's called Only Connect the goals of a liberal arts education. It was actually a, a, a commencement talk, I think about 20 years ago. So I Googled it, found it online, and I really did have one of those kind of aha moments, sort of like energy going down your spine. I realized, oh my gosh, this, this helps. This helps me to make the case that I've been wanting to make the case, uh, that I've been wanting to make in terms of how these two concepts overlap. So I'm gonna read you now the core of Cronin's article in which he talks about the 10 qualities he admires most in people who've been liberally educated. He doesn't mean liberal versus conservative, he means the liberal arts. And as I read these, I'm gonna list these 10. Think about how they map well to what we might think a social entrepreneur is, right? Somebody who's using creative ways to affect social change. So I'll, I'll, I'll read these now. First of all, people who have really thrived in the liberal arts, according to Cronin, they listen and they hear. Number two, they read and they understand. They can talk with anyone. They can write clearly and persuasively and movingly. They can solve a wide variety of puzzles and problems. Number six, they respect rigor, not so much for its own sake, but as a way of seeking truth. And number seven, they practice humility, tolerance, and self-criticism. Number eight, they understand how to get things done in the world. Number nine, they nurture and empower the people around them. 
And number 10, they follow E.M. Forster's injunction from Howard's end, only connect. Famous phrase, only connect. So when I read that, I sort of jumped out of my seat and I said, that's going to help. And it has. And, and the more I've looked into what the liberal arts is about, going back often to the pieces that were shared with, with Chris and I back in the summer of 2011, the more I have seen that people who are studying what social entrepreneurs do at their best, what they care about, what drives them in life, that the characteristics really map each other very well. Uh, another way to talk about this is uh, an, a book that's uh, written by Anthony Cronman, a great scholar at Yale. And he wrote a book called Education's End, Why Colleges and Universities Have Given Up on the Meaning of Life. And it's a beautiful book, not uncontroversial, but essentially he says that we are failing our students because since the Second World War, we've given up on what should be the crux of the liberal arts, which is know thyself. Right? What is a life of meaning to you? What is a life well lived? Um, and I've discovered that actually the best social entrepreneurs are asking that question pretty actively of themselves, which is exciting. So we use an exercise, for example, in my classes where we, we begin my classes, and I do it in many other settings too, where students ask each other, what matters to you? What matters to you? And that becomes a theme for, for what we do. What matters to you? Uh, we, we think deliberately about students' identity and agency, right? So two fancy academic terms for who you are and what you think you can do. Uh, and, and all that is working. Um, it's, it brings me back again to this Transy conference in, in terms of Jeff, Jeff Fryman. He said, you know, the essence of what we should be doing is what he just boiled down to being humanism. Right? What is it to be human? Right. And, and none of this is really a mystery if you've thought or studied about the liberal arts, but for me, in a certain sense, a latecomer to, to these ideas, as an economist, it made me realize there's a beautiful overlap between a model of social change based in sort of economic principles and the core of the liberal arts. So it's been a blast since then. And we have, again, I think we've made the case pretty well. It's a case that, that we hear being made elsewhere. We have, uh, the center was founded in January 2012, our Center for Social Entrepreneurship. We do a lot of things uh, for, uh, we have curricular programs, of course, that I mentioned, social entrepreneurship and the liberal arts. We have co-curricular programming for our, our, our um, students uh, of, of various kinds. We support them to do summer grants, for example, to, to try to start new NGOs, that kind of thing. Um, we have a symposium every January. So our symposium, our fifth annual one, was just uh, the theme was, was this, on leading a life of meaning and purpose. So we really go, go to the mat on this idea. And um, as Rachel mentioned, we have a June forum, which is for educators and, uh, uh, who do all this for a living and are thinking about the, the uh, liberal arts. It's for faculty and staff. And our fifth annual one this June will be on mindfulness, inclusivity, and best practices. So if you're interested in that, I'm happy to share more. And it's a blast, and it's very beautiful. And as Rachel mentioned, the, the mountains of Vermont before the mosquitoes come out. So it's quite, it's quite nice. Uh, and we've been able to partner with some of the leaders in the field, Ashoka U, um, which, which is developing networks of folks who do all this, and another group called Echoing Green, among others. So what's been the result of all of this? And again, I really do look back to that, that moment at Transylvania when, when Chris and I met as sort of a spark for this. Um, first of all, we've made a lot of mistakes. I can talk about those in the Q&A, but I want to acknowledge that there's a whole bunch of stuff that we didn't do well. We've adjusted to some of those things. Some of them I think we're probably, I know we're still making. So we, we've, we've definitely, we have a lot of sort of bruises that we've gotten along the way and, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to figure this out. Um, but, but the punchline is that this approach has worked for us. Thinking about social entrepreneurship in the liberal arts, it's worked. Uh, there's something profound that happens when faculty bring these ideas into a classroom. Uh, and, and we know because the student demand is growing, every constituency at Middlebury loves this with the ex important exception of a subset of the faculty, and, and we're working on them. Um, one of the, so, and the way we've done social entrepreneurship again is to focus on this idea of empathy, reflection, right, bringing reflection in, the, the mission of our center includes this idea that students learn how to reflect, connect, analyze, and engage. And basically, we really spend most of our time on reflection and then a little bit of connection. 
And it's been very beautiful. It, you know, when it works, students are suddenly thinking about deep listening. We, we, we're, we're sort of getting them slowed down and, and really think about what it is to really be humble in life, to be in solidarity with people who, who don't have the privileges they do. I talked with Rachel about this, that there's social entrepreneurship in, on our campus anyway has been a bit of a Trojan horse, right? Because students hear about something called social entrepreneurship, they get all excited, and then before they know it, as I'll talk about later, they're reading 1 Corinthians 13. And you know, we're thinking about all these texts about what it is to be human. And I love all that. Um, we've had some other successes. One of our students founded a great company that if you're interested, it's called Sword and Plow, converting, repurposing old uh, military material to high-end fashion bags. Uh, another student of mine, a brilliant woman named Rana Abdelhamid, has started an NGO called WISE, a Women's Initiative for Self-Empowerment to help young Muslim women to have a better sense of their own identity and agency. Those are two sort of stellar examples. But honestly, we're most proud of the dozens of students who've come through our center co-curricularly and curricularly and just gotten a little better sense of, again, identity and agency. That's, I think, the best measure of our success. And then the last thing I'll say about these last few years is that we're definitely part of a movement. So social entrepreneurship is sort of everywhere these days, uh, and, and that's exciting, and I'm happy to talk about the evidence for that. But, so we feel pretty good about that, but, but we've identified a big problem as I alluded to, and that's, that's what that brings me to this idea of slow learning. Right away, first of all, we identified the fact, kind of associated with the sexiness of this idea of social entrepreneurship, that um, it was becoming yet one more thing for our way too busy students to do. And that was a problem, because they just keep adding things onto their otherwise full plate. So we had a great student for example, decide, inspired by our presence, that he was going to um, start a company that was going to have sort of power bars, but the protein source would be crickets. And um, so we, he got a little money to do this, and in our old stone mill that I mentioned, um, he began to manufacture and, and try these various recipes for cricket-based power bars. And, and they actually ended up being not bad by the end, but um, two things happened that weren't that good. The first was that, uh, the, the old stone mill that we have is, is on top of, the bottom floor is a restaurant. So my colleague Liz Robinson one day, who oversaw it at the time, gets this panic call from the head of the restaurant, the chef, and he says, um, there's a problem, crickets are pouring down into our, <laughs> our, our kitchen, please stop that. And, uh, <laughs> and then secondly, more, more importantly, the student really had a very difficult semester, so he ended up str struggling very badly with his, uh, his, dis his thesis. And so that was a lesson for us, that you, you can't just keep adding things to the plate of these big, uh, busy students. Um, and that was part of the, a much bigger story, and it's a story you all will recognize, I don't doubt, which is the state of education right now. And it's related to time. And even at a bucolic place like this, and Middlebury is just as beautiful, and albeit with a different you know, set of, of weather patterns, um, there, there's something amiss in education right now, I would, I would surmise. And it's, it, it relates to time, it relates to the fact that we're all just simply moving too fast. We're moving too fast. So, like you all, we get these high achievers, we get overachievers, I think most of the faculty are overachievers as well. It's a, it's a culture where it's more on your resume is better than less, you know, parents breathing down people's neck, uh, back, Everything is available to us online, right? And so we can get anything we want, and that makes for a fast, fast kind of go-go culture. We all have these things, and we're addicted to them, and that gets us going in this kind of very fast, fast-paced life. Um, and I worry a lot about this, what we might call a sort of fast learning, um, that, that we are falling prey to foreshadow a, a, a phrase I'm going to use in a moment, to what we might call speed shackles. Speed shackles. Speed is, is putting handcuffs on us. Fast learning, advanced placement, double majors, extra minors, students on the go, cramming stuff and then forgetting what they learned. We all know that's true. Here's, here's a really unfortunate manifestation of, of this on our campuses. So one professor is passing another professor uh, in, in the middle of a busy semester. How are you? Busy. So am I. Busy. And that's all they say to each other. And that happens all the time on our campus. 
So we rush, we're assigning more, we're expecting more, you all know this can happen. At our worst, it doesn't always happen, but it can happen and I fear what it does. Um, it's sort of an empty calorie version of way the, the, the way the liberal arts should be, right? If, if, and if we can't get it right here, if we can't get away from this idea of too much reading, more problem sets, more to do, where, where are we gonna get it right? We have succumbed to, to this idea, we're part of the multitude, again, foreshadowing something, the multitude who mistake frenzy for efficiency. So I think that's happening a lot, mistaking frenzy for efficiency. Uh, and this is very damaging. It's really damaging. So last spring, uh, we had at Middlebury a student take his life, and it, it was the first time in, in a long time. And to be honest, none of us was surprised. The stress levels were just going through the roof. My colleagues who, who do some combination of counseling or student life were just seeing excruciating pressure among our students. In fact, one of them put it very well several months ago. Our students show up and they're burned out. Uh, demand for counseling was going up 20% per year, Ye has gone up 20% per year, year after year. So after, after this student uh, committed suicide, we, we, st we faculty got together for a faculty meeting. And it was a faculty meeting where, amazingly, everybody showed up, <laughs> which doesn't always happen. And, and it was just this deep sense of what is to be done. You know, something's not right here. And at a subsequent one this fall, there was the same thought that, you know, we need some sort of cultural shift on, at Middlebury. Uh, and, and it can't be right if there's all this fast learning and students are under this excruciating pressure. The last thing I'll say in terms of, uh, of how we, this idea of slow learning came to be is what happened within our Center for Social Entrepreneurship, which again, I mentioned, with, and Rachel did too, was founded in 2012. As last year came to an end, so June of, of 2015, my colleague Heather Newworth, one of the other co-founders, just kind of made it clear that we looked around and said, we're all exhausted as the staff of the center, that we were doing too much. When we started our, our center, we had an afternoon retreat, and one of the things that we decided was that the culture for our center is that we would take care of each other. So we would look out for each other as humans to humans. But, but Heather helped me realize that we weren't looking after our, ourselves. So each of us on our staff, we were working too hard, and we weren't doing what we should do, which is to slow down and take a breath. So Heather began to, to ask us to embrace this idea that less is more. Great phrase, and, and we've done that. And then sort of from that and other conversations uh, came this, up, this idea of slow learning. Um, let, me, let me just pause there, because I'm curious about Westmont. More or less, I know at your best you're amazing, but when you're at your worst, and I, what I was characterizing is, is I think Middlebury, when we're at our worst, is this rush, rush, rush. Is that, is, would you say that describes here? Yeah, okay. All right, all right, good, good. So, yeah, it's, and it's all too familiar, and, and uh, friends of mine who, who travel in, with, say, other deans at liberal arts schools in the East, they're, they're finding this everywhere. So, I want to throw out the idea of, of slow learning as, as maybe something that can help us to, to change the culture a little bit. And it's inspired by the slow food movement, and I know some of you will know. So I'm going to use the slow food movement, which I'll describe in a moment, as a metaphor for slow learning. Uh, after describing slow food, I'll talk about slow learning, and then I'm going to finish in a way that I didn't on Saturday with um, a conversation about how this can manifest itself in a Christian campus, on a Christian campus, like Westmont versus one that's very secular, like Middlebury, and I'm really excited about that conversation. So what is slow learning? Oh, sorry, <laughs> what is slow food? Um, I'm going to use a few quotes here from, from, from people who, who, who've thought about it for a while. So slow food. It's the food that feeds the planet, food that has a soul, a story, a profound link with the land. So a soul, a story, a profound link with the land. How did this come to be? In December 1989, delegates from 15 countries endorsed something called a slow food manifesto which goes like this. It begins like this. Born and nurtured under the sign of industrialization, this century, the 1900s, first invented the machine and then modeled its lifestyle after it. Speed became our shackles. We fell prey to the same virus, 
the fast life that fractures our customs and assails us, even in our own homes, for forcing us to ingest fast food. And the, the founder of this, who I'll quote in a little bit, was enraged that a McDonald's had, had shown up in, in, in Italy and, and all that fast food implied. The manifesto then goes on to make a case for slow food to be taken, and I'm in his quotes again, to be taken with slow and prolonged enjoyment, to let us rediscover the rich varieties and aromas of local cuisines. So for the last 25 years, this movement has really grown. Uh, it's found in, in 150 countries in terms of organizations that have sort of taken on this phrase. Um, and it's part of a, a broader sort of rediscovery, I think it's fair to say, of the pleasures of good food with a commitment to community and the environment, to again paraphrase them. Um, it, it's part of a, somebody said in the, in, on, on Saturday, it's no surprise that in Vermont we embrace this, right? Slow food is a good fit for us with our emphasis on the local and so forth. So what does it mean? Like, how does it manifest itself to be on the words in a manifesto? When slow food is happening, let me suggest that maybe five, there are five characteristics of a slow food experience, right? So consider a meal on, on a weekend um, among friends. First of all, yeah, you've slowed down. Right? That's one characteristic. So you're deliberate about the food you pick, right? Intentional about going around uh, to places and finding these exciting uh, tomatoes and, and other local ingredients, right? There's sort of part of it is the planning of a good meal. We all recognize that that's a beautiful part of a, of a kind of a slowed down experience. The second characteristic is, is that it's, you, it's very welcoming. You're, you're bringing people in. So if we all reflect on the meals we adore, Thanksgiving being a good example, it's not just old friends, it's new friends. So it's a combination of people you know and people you don't. That, that can commit, that can uh, contribute to a sense of community, as noted. Third, I think the key word for this, actually, I've discovered in thinking about it, is this idea of really savoring, right? Savoring what it's about. McDonald's, you don't savor much, do you? Despite the ads that they're throwing at us. Um, but, but you're savoring what it is to be part of a meal, right? All your senses, the feel of making pasta, right, or dough, the sounds of, of, of garlic, you know, uh, cracking on the, in the, on the stove, the sights, right, the colors that come together with a beautiful meal. I'm getting hungry just talking about this. <laughs> Obviously, the smells and the tastes, too. So it's a very sensual experience, if, if a transient one. That's, that savoring is essential to this. It's the essence of it. Uh, fourth is, is, is finding joy, right? The joy of it all is huge, right? Joy is sometimes elusive for us and we can find joy in food. And then finally there's a, and this is critical, there's a kind of advocacy aspect to this. So I'll, I'll come back to Vermont, right? People who embrace local food and all this are not only embracing food but it's part of sort of a political approach with a small p, kind of the best best way to say, to talk about how we should live and how, how our politics should even be. So uh, if we think about local food, for example, that's an element of it, to be advocates for being able to grow food locally. Uh, if we think about food justice, right, questions about who's growing our food, I know a question you all ask here. So it's not isolated, let's say, to what happens in an afternoon or an evening among, among good and dear friends, there's a, there's a sort of reaching out aspect to it, part of something that you think is much uh, bigger than yourselves. So this, is, this resonates, doesn't it? I mean, when we think about uh, 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 culture, the, the film The Big Night launched a lot of this 20 years ago, a lot of films that capture the joy of cooking. Um, uh, regional foods, just taking the South, for example, African-American traditions, I mean, it's called soul food. <laughs> soul food. Uh, New Orleans, we think of gumbo, all the states with their barbecues, right? So all of these feel like something that's right. Um, somebody mentioned in the, in the Q&A on Saturday brisket, and, and a, a former student of his had used brisket as an example for what we want to do as educators, right? So brisket starts as this very tough thing, and by the time you've cooked it for a day, it's beautiful and soft, right? So there's something to it. What I like about it, actually, to, as I begin to push the metaphor, is that our food is actually already embraced on our campuses. So we have a, my, a new program in food studies 
we do, uh, like Rachel, we have, we're giving students the opportunity to start businesses and so forth, and every third one seems to be food related. So we've got a new mac and cheese truck that, or cart that's going around, and uh, another student has come back with an idea for yogurt bowls, something she saw in Australia. So our students get food, actually, now, at least this is what I'm finding at Middlebury, that because it's tangible. My daughter, who's 17, is dying to work on a farm, right, because it, it's, it's something you can do. It's not just staring at a laptop or one of these. So what's the analogy, then, to slow learning, right? You've probably been able to running this idea in your head, and I want to talk about it a little bit, and then let me, let me go explore this secular sort of Christian possibility. Slow learning, let me just throw out a definition. Um, it's education that makes us human. It's education that has a soul, a story, a profound link with our communities. It's an approach, as noted, that declares less is more, that promotes the read and then the reread, right? Text, taking our time, bringing mindfulness, the practice of mindfulness into the classroom. It's, a, it's an approach that honors students who do unplug, who reflect, who are actively raising questions about their own identity in this complicated age. Um, it's, an, it's an approach that embraces storytelling. Right? At our best meals, we tell stories. How do we bring storytelling into the classroom? Okay, so what will it look like? What does slow learning look like? It, it, I'll just give some examples of, of, I think, it manifesting itself at Middlebury. A uh, course at, at Middlebury we have called the Sophomore Seminar in the Liberal Arts, in which students are asking, what is the good life? And how shall I live it? Uh, how shall I live it? They're reading great classical and modern texts, from Socrates to bell hooks, uh, and they're, practi they're actively practicing mindfulness techniques. Right? So that's a good example. A first year seminar, another example, that regularly starts with just 10 minutes of silence. None of these things around, just silence. Uh, a science class that includes unhurried, kind of early morning treks, not just to gather data, but to celebrate the glories of nature, sort of an equal measure, to slow down. A class that regularly takes time for yoga, right? maybe followed by a meal together. Right? Meals are a beautiful thing. Um, so he, here's the thing about this, and again, I hope a lot of you are, are scratching your heads and saying this. I mean, it's no mystery. <laughs> slow learning is what we do at our best. It's what we do at our best. It's what we know we should be doing, right? When we haven't succumbed to this fast, fast, fast pace that is 2016. Um, intriguingly, the phrase, if it proves to be sticky, has something in common with social capital, which I studied when I got my dissertation in the, in the 80s and, or in the 90s, and social entrepreneurship. So if you think about social capital, norms and networks that affect economic outcomes, and social entrepreneurship, it's very much old wine and new bottles, right? So when social capital came along and Richard Robert Putnam of Harvard began to sort of cut his teeth on it as a public uh, intellectual, the, the rural sociologists and the anthropologists were really pissed off, right? Because you know, we've been talking about this for decades, but it's not, we just haven't used the term social capital. And, and the same is true with social entrepreneurship. If we go way back to, to you know, folks who, who led social change in the 1800s and 1900s, um, we can think of people who, who were affecting social change, and we would now call them social entrepreneurship, but, but back then we didn't. So old wine and new bottles, academics love to say, well, these are, these are bad phrases. The definitions are lousy. And I'm sure the definitions are not that great. There, there's a lot of them, and none of them's perfect. But I think those critiques miss the point. Social capital is an is, is idea that is used all the time. Actually, it's cited more than human capital now. Uh, social entrepreneurship is here to stay. Uh, and it may be slow learning. It's not because they tell us something we didn't know. It's actually the reverse. They tell us something we know. They're useful terms. So instead of saying norms and networks that facilitate collective action, we can say social capital. Instead of saying um, innovative approaches to social change that use businesses, we can say social entrepreneurship. And slow learning, I think, is similar. So I like that aspect of it, and I think, again, it sort of deflects people who say, well, we've been doing this all the time. That's true. But, but it helps us to focus on maybe what we should be doing. So let's say you're drawn to this concept. So what can we do? Like, how can we kind of move this forward a little bit? Uh, students, join less clubs. Right? You've got into Westmont. <laughs> so join less clubs. Slow down. Uh, 
staff, you know, less meetings, right? Deans, I'm tempted to mention that to you all. Um, and certainly faculty, I think we can make our syllabi less intense. I think those of us who've taught for a while realize that less is more works very well. I have. My, my classes have gotten better as, as I've assigned less. So I think there's some specific things we can do. Um, electronics are, are really insidious. And so, you know, all of us turn off the smartphone, uh, close the laptop, take a walk with nowhere in particular to go, right? It sounds easy and I'm, I'm, I'm clutching this thing all the time, but there, there are things we can do to slow ourselves down. I do think meditation and mindfulness are a huge part of it. One thing I didn't say, by the way, and I, and I meant to earlier, is that um, I am not the only person thinking about this idea of slow learning, uh, not at all. So there's a scholar uh, now retired from University of Colorado, who's, I believe, at Oxford now, who's talked about slow education at the primary school level. And it turns out a colleague of mine, a philosophy professor down the road at uh, Green Mountain College, has been playing with this idea too. So uh, there are other people kind of exploring the slow food connection, and, and some of them are surely doing it better than I am. So I just I want to make that clear that there's, there's kind of a nice discovery out there uh, uh, in several places about how this might work for, for education, broadly defined. Um, so let me, I want to finish with a couple of observations about what I think is the essence of all this, because I'm sure you're getting a feel for what it's about. Um, I, I've decided that sort of the essence of what we're trying to do with the liberal arts and, and maybe slow learning as a way to remind <coughs> us about that is simply to treat each other as, as human beings, as human beings. Now that, that sounds obvious again. But again, it means to, to not say, oh, there's a sophomore over there, or there's an assistant professor, there's a member of the custodial staff, right? there's a dean, but to, to recognize that these are human beings right? in all their complexities. Uh, Rachel and I talked about the great phrase from Walt Whitman, I contain multitudes. Let's remind ourselves that each of us contains multitudes, and so when a student, I find now when a student's walking into my office for office hours, Instead of jumping right into, you know, what's, what are you not understanding about supply and demand, I'll, I'll just slow them down and I'll start asking them other questions. You know, how are your other classes? Tell me this. And quickly they realize what's going on is that I want to talk to them and engage them as a human being. And that, that changes the, the relationship very much. And I think, but to do that you have to slow down. In my case, I have to shut my laptop, right, not to keep an eye on what might be coming in over the electronic transom. Think about what we all do at a campus like Westmont, and I'm going to come back to those five characteristics I mentioned earlier of slow food, and I'll just, I'll just invite you to, as I mentioned them, to think about how they, could, they can just enhance what we do at our best. So again, to slow down in your classes, right, um, in any number of ways, to invite, to welcome in, right, not just the students, but maybe bring in other people to, ex to, to expand what the community is. Uh, within your class. Third, to savor in the senses. I actually think you can think about how food itself comes into classes and, and how you can have fun with the sights and, and smells and sounds and the feel of learning. Actually be very explicit about that I think can be quite important. Number four is, is this idea of joy, right? Joy, I mean here we are for 80, 90, 100 years if we're lucky. Let's remind ourselves that joy is a lot of what this is about. Carlo Petrini, the founder of Slow Food, says this, and it's a beautiful way to connect, I think, the liberal arts, social innovation, and maybe slow food, and slow learning, rather. So Petrini says, if you want to change the world, don't do it with sadness, do it with joy. We need to bring joy into our classrooms. And then fifth is to advocate, right? To say that this is part of people who aren't just going to accept the liberal arts as they've been or as they've come to be known lately, but to sort of make a case for something different um, and in doing so making a case for our vision of, you know, a, a, a more uh, a beloved community, one might put it, right? So part of something much bigger than ourselves. Um, another way to think about this as I close on slow learning is, and I'm going to push the metaphor a little bit more, so if for slow food the ingredients are key, right? There's a real emphasis on ingredients. So heirloom tomatoes, right, crawfish, you know, wild rice here in the United States, native corn, spring lamb. This is what slow food foodies, <laughs> as they're come to know, be known, talk about. 
that it seems to me that the ingredients of what we do, educators, in a similar way, are, are the human beings with whom we work, the students, right, and others. So the earnest learners, the celebrated teachers, dedicated counsel, uh, counselors, academic stewards of different kinds, and yes, our community friends and allies. So that's the ingredients of what we're trying to do. We're trying to bring those ingredients together in ways that, that are, I think, comparable. So if you grant me that, um, if you grant me the, a following kind of description of slow food, right? So slow, the best slow food chefs combine by a beautiful culinary ingredients, fundamental taste, textures, and colors in order to create our most treasured dining experiences. Maybe you'll, you'll like the idea that the best slow learning educators combine via the beautiful human beings with whom they work, uh, knowledge, resources, and networks, and among others, to create our most treasured and educational experiences. So that process that the best slow food chefs do is what we're trying to do in the classroom. And that includes processes designed to affect social change. I want to make that clear, because that's what, that's what our conference was about. And, and as you heard in my background, that's what I, I, I'm a John Dewey person very much in that sense. Um, and the last thing I'll say, I think you can push the metaphor one more time, is that you know, culinary ingredients have their bruises, right? The tomato that has a bruise, but you throw it in anyway, or the little bone in the, in the salmon and you, you're okay with it, right? And that's all of us, right? I mean, we all are like really flawed. You all think about that occasionally on this campus in, in some textual ways, and, uh, right? And it allows us to kind of laugh about how we are and, and, and we're not perfect. There's a lot of talk these days about failing forward, right? And slow food people maybe make a meal every once in a while that's no, no good. And well, that's the way it goes. And so I think there's, a, there's, a, there's an embrace of our flaws and foibles that I think we can do under this banner uh, additionally. Uh, to honor each human being, to savor the human experience. My God, if we can't do that in the liberal arts, where are our students going to do that? And where are we as educators going to do it? So I'm hoping that the, that the slow learning metaphor can help. So I want to finish um, and with something I didn't get to say um, on Saturday. And, and I'll just throw these ideas out. And, and if it's useful and interesting, maybe we can have a bit of a conversation about it. Um, and, and what I want to talk about is how slow learning, again, recognizing that kind of we, we're all doing all this at our best anyway, how it might manifest itself in a Christian college or one that, that, that has another religious tradition at its foundation, and a secular one, like Middlebury. And this intrigues me a lot for a whole lot of reasons I can get into. For a Christian college like you all, I mean, you have a big advantage, right? Because you're working with your students and you yourselves are slowing down to pray, right? And, and, and the big, great meditative traditions in, of, the, of the Christian tradition. So you have, a, you have a head start already course in this idea of slowing down and reflecting on who we are, right? Appreciating the world, savoring. So I'm, I'm not, not going to keep talking because I will illustrate just how poorly schooled I am in, in the things you do as, as part of your faith here. But clearly, um, a, a, one of the people on Saturday said this idea of taking time to be holy, right? <laughs> a beautiful phrase. And, and you all have all those tools that we might not in a secular context. Um, so I'm, I'm interested to see how it can play out here and again whether almost you can, you're, you're right there and, and have those ingredients again that those of us at a place like Middlebury don't. Nevertheless, I think it's intriguing to think about what one can do in a secular place like most of the East Coast liberal arts schools. And what I've done is, because I'm a newcomer to him, is to say go back to Emerson, right, who, who believed in God, he was a spiritual guy, but had went a long way from the training that, that you know had him trained in divinity in his early twenties, um, and it, and it was you know the kind of elusive, sometimes unsatisfying view of of what the deity might be and so forth, uh, but it was one nevertheless that he thought about deeply. And then you know Emerson, who's just glorious in so many ways, you know, the, he says the purpose of life is not to be happy, it is to be useful, to be honorable to be compassionate, to have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well. So that's a pretty good description of, of what we might be advocating in a secular context, in a sort of unthreatening context. Um, 
More deliberately, uh, I want to end with this, that um, I was raised Presbyterian. I mentioned to Mark, who's here visiting, um, thanks to a, a, a great gentleman who died um, a few years ago on Palm Sunday, Guthrie Spears, whose father was a minute Presbyterian minister, and two of his sons are also. Um, and so I, I, have, uh, I have just enough knowledge of the New Testament to be dangerous. And uh, like a lot of people, I, I, I just adore the text that is 1 Corinthians 13. Um, not 1 Corinthians, I think that's what Donald Trump would say. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but so I've actually, in the last two or three years, been using that text early on in my courses, just about all my courses, actually. And I, what I do is after, you know, the, the, the first part about, um, that introduces it, and, and then before we get to seeing through the glass darkly and so forth, I highlight the, 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 uh, the passage that reads, love is patient and kind, love is not jealous or boastful, it's not arrogant or rude, love does not insist on its own way, it's not irritable or resentful, it doesn't rejoice at wrong, but it rejoices in the right, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So I put that up on a PowerPoint slide, and I'll just talk about it with the students, and I'll, I'll say, look, what up there can you not do? You know, can you not be patient? Can you not be kind? And sort of go through things, and a few hands do go up when they say, I, I can't be patient, but sort of making the point I'm making. <laughs> but essentially, you know, we, what I, I'm trying to make the case that what, what um, Paul is asking us to think about is that love, which, as you know, in the end of the text says it's still, it's always going to be an elusive thing, but it's there, it's accessible to all of us, even as, as we're still always going to be seeing through the glass darkly. So I'm able to bring in, in a very secular context, where some of my students are Muslim and Jewish and so forth, and, and, and not a lot of practicing uh, folks of any way, shape, or form, bring in texts like this. And, and so that has been very powerful for me, actually, and for them. And, I'll finish with something very beautiful in terms of thinking about love. I mean, I say to my faculty colleagues these days, like, we should be talking about love, even though that makes them all shudder. Wait a minute, what does that have to do with biology or you know, economics? But um, we should be talking about love, actually. And so if you go back to the piece that I mentioned from Cronin, Only Connect, um, I'm going to read a couple of parts of this, because I think y you'll see where, where, why this all can come together in a certain way. So he says that those 10 characteristics, you remember, are as good as an answer as any that I know, I'm quoting him now, to the question of what it means to be a liberally educated person. But they are also an equally fine description of that most powerful and generous form of human connection we call love. I do not mean romantic or passionate love, but the love that lies at the heart of all the great religious faiths, not eros, but agape. He goes on to say, liberal education nurtures human freedom in the service of human community, which is to say that it celebrates love. Whether we speak, and notice the little, I think an allusion to 1 Corinthians here, whether we speak of our schools or our universities or ourselves, I hope we will hold fast to this as our constant practice in the full depth and richness of its many meanings only connect. So at the heart of the liberal arts vision, according to Cronin, is love. And I love that. <laughs> and I found that in the secular uh, uh, context that is Middlebury, students love that too. And, and I, when I put this in front of students, when I'm asking them to think about a life of meaning and purpose, they say, nobody else is doing that on this campus, or not very many people are. That, that's not fair. There are people, but maybe they're not paying attention. But but they, again, they love the idea that the classroom can be a place when you're exploring these deep, deep points, and that's a good thing. And I guess I will finish by saying that I think slow learning is a way that we can maybe do that even better. And I'm interested to see, again, how it might manifest itself here and at Middlebury. So those are my comments. Thank you.